Well, sometimes what you're seeing in the neck is actually thyroid that didn't, again, didn't read the book and showed up in the wrong place. When you look at that, it's going to look just like the thyroid gland. Um, remember, though, it's acting just like a thyroid gland. And if you have a multi-nodular thyroid gland, you can get nodules in your ectopic thyroid as well. Typically, these are in the midline, either above or below the gland. But, and you can stick a needle in it and confirm that you're looking at thyroid tissue. So here's a patient with a, a mass in the upper part of their, or sort of in the sternal notch, and this is the normal thyroid here. And here's the abnormal tissue with sonographically very similar to the gland. Here it is transversely. And that was proven to be ectopic thyroid in a retrosternal location. Another patient where this is sitting out lateral, a little more atypical, and actually looks very much like some of the metastatic lymph nodes. Here's carotid and jugular. And when you do a clip through the lesion, here's the lesion here, it's quite a ways from the thyroid. You're thinking there might be a little bridge right there, but it's really hard to connect. So what do we do? We did put, uh, just to do a quick FNA of that and make sure that those were normal thyroid cells. Thyroglossal duct cysts, the most common congenital mass in the neck. So the thyroid gland in the embryo, who knew back in medical school when you took embryology, you actually had to remember embryology. So the thyroid starts at the base of the tongue and climbs down into its spot at the bottom of the uh, neck. And there often can be a remnant duct or strip of tissue that goes from the base of the tongue right down to the gland. And the cyst occurs somewhere along that tract of tissue. Theoretically, when you move your tongue, the gland, the thyroglossal duct cyst will also move. So if you have the patient stick their tongue out and put it back in, you should see the thyroglossal duct cyst go up and down. If you biopsy thyroglossal duct cysts, you may get squamous cells if the cyst is located at the top, sort of more near the base of the tongue, or you can get thyroid cells if it's more inferior and a little closer to the thyroid gland. And these do get surgically resected because those thyroid cells can cause cancer or turn into cancer. So again, most are right in the midline and at or just below the hyoid bone. About a quarter of the time they're anechoic, but they can also have debris. They can mimic a solid lesion or they can be very heterogeneous. Here's a thyroglossal duct cyst related to the thyroid cartilage here, and you can see that it actually starts in the midline and sort of drapes over, very anechoic, very characteristic with its relationship to the midline cartilage. Here's another patient who came in. This is an ENT surgeon, probably in his uh, mid to mid-60s, I'd say. And he came in and he said, I have a thyroglossal duct cyst. Anyway, here's a picture of his lesion. You can see it's a little bit off midline, and in his instance, an older gentleman, he has a calcified thyroid cartilage. That's what you're seeing there. It is related to the thyroid cartilage. And he insisted that I take this picture, the sagittal image of him sticking his tongue in and out, because he was very sure that it was moving. And you can see a little bit of movement, and you can see that the cyst does go right uh, deep midline in to, um, to confirm that it is. And indeed, he was right, path, path, a thyroglossal duct cyst. Branchial cleft cyst, we did see an example of this a little bit earlier. This happens when the branchial cleft does not obliterate, and classically, again, on the anterior surface of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Lateral to the carotid artery, if you can see a beak going between the internal and external carotids, that is pathognomonic. If you aspirate it, you will not get thyroid cells. So here's an example sitting laterally in the neck. We're just related to the submandibular gland here. Here's the submandibular gland transversely and the thyroglossal duct cyst. Another patient who came in with a very large mass under the jaw on the right looks like a solid lesion. But when we put a needle in it for the FNA, you can see the little crystals or debris coming over to the needle. And it turns out to be complex cyst, um, cystic fluid in this bronchial cleft cyst. Another patient came in. In this instance, you see a debris level and notice that it's sitting right between the common and, uh, sorry, the internal and external carotids. And when we turn the color on, you can see again that debris floating around that lets you know you're dealing with a complex cystic lesion rather than a solid mass. Ectopic thymus is something that you want to be extremely aware of if you're scanning any pediatric patients or young adults. In uh, over two thirds of patients who are under the age of 15 have thymus that goes up behind the thyroid at a recent MR series. 
The mass that you'll see looks exactly like the thymus, but if you haven't scanned a thymus, you may not realize that thymuses look a lot like papillary thyroid cancer. So here's a six-year-old who was sent down to see us from uh, another state up in New England with this lesion right here, with the diagnosis done uh, uh, at an outside hospital. He was said, you have cancer, you need to go down to Boston and have that taken out. And here's the lesion sagittally. It's very large, runs behind the thyroid, looks like it's full of speckles. But here's the thymus right here. And we could see that this lesion was contiguous with his thymus as it came right up through the neck. So we watched that for two years and it did not turn into thyroid cancer. Another seven-year-old, again, a transverse, very low image. We're down here at the innominate vessels. This is the thymus here. You can see it, it's a heterogeneous, it's got speckles in it. And if you look up at the left lobe in this seven-year-old, you can see this heterogeneous lesion matches. It's the same. Here it is transversely, but this one did not communicate to the thymus, so we did biopsy this and, so, and prove that it was ectomic thymus. Another thing to think about in the neck when you see a fluid collection is a lymphocele, sometimes called a lymphatic malformation or a cystic hygroma. These can be congenital, post-operative, or post-traumatic. These occur in the posterior cervical triangle. So the theme here is the location is very helpful when you're trying to elucidate what the etiology could be. And here's a patient, a young man, who came in with a palpable mass of just a fullness almost, because these are soft. This is a seven and a half centimeter fluid collection in the left uh, lower neck. And here it is transversely. And look trans, uh, on the clip that when we push on it, it moves completely separate from the thyroid gland here. And it, the carotid artery has stayed medial. When the surgeon got in to, to resect this, he had to go all the way down to the thoracic duct because it was ballooning right off the thoracic duct. Remember that uh, we saw a lot of metastatic thyroid cancer, but you're also uh, going to often see metastatic disease from other etiologies in the neck. And again, it, the lesion is round. It's crossed your tissue planes here. It's very irregular, um, hard. The patients come in, it's hard. I have a hard mass right here. This was metastatic melanoma. Here's another patient who came in and um, said that, you know, there's a, the doctor found a bump right here in my neck, and he has an ugly enlarged lymph node in his neck. His thyroid was clean. And he says, but you know, doc, I'm not sure why my primary care really cares about this, because you should see this thing on my shoulder. And he has this four centimeter big mass growing off his, like, out, out of his shoulder, and they're in for this little bump in his neck. This turns out to be a large cell lymphoma. Uh, moving to nerve sheath tumors. Now, these are pretty rare, but uh, if you do enough ultrasound of the neck looking for thyroid nodules, they're going to turn up as well. The most common are schwannomas, neurofibromas, and ganglioneuromas. Most of your neurofibroma patients know they have neurofibromatosis, so that's a big hint. Uh, these are hypoechoic and pretty uh, well-defined, pretty smooth margins. And these are usually posterior to the carotid sheath, or they split the common carotid and the internal jugular vein. And here we see a patient with a biopsy-proven schwannoma, and you can see the common carotid here and the jugular vein here. Another patient, you see the normal right lobe. Here's the trachea. It's a composite image. Here's the left lobe, and then here's this ginormous hypoechoic mass that's lifted up the carotid artery here, and you can see it transversely and sagittally. Again, the jugular vein here, carotid here. This is a young patient, 17 years old, with a malignant nerve sheath tumor in her known neurofibromatosis. Uh, teratomas are, again, one of the terrible Ts that can happen in the superior mediastinum, and we can see them in the neck. They're defined teratoma dermoid or epidermoid based on how many germ cell layers they have in them. You're not going to be able to do that sonographically. That's going to be a pathology diagnosis. And here's the lesion here, pretracheal separate from the thyroid, very homogeneous, looks just like thyroid, could have been, you know, ectopic thyroid tissue, but at pathology turned out to be a dermoid. 17-year-old uh, girl who came in with a palpable mass, again, fullness, describing fullness in her left neck, and she had a five-centimeter complex cystic lesion. We thought, well, it's a little low, but it could be either a bronchial cleft cyst or a lymphocele. And here it is here. You can see that it's displacing the color. It's definitely not a solid uh, lesion. So we put a needle in and got pure pus out of it. And she was 
um, systemically asymptomatic, no, no pain, no fever, but 20 cc's of pus pulled out of that, and this turned out to be a piriform sinus fistula that had probably been brewing for years in her neck, and she'd just been living with it. Um, one thing to be aware of is that when you scan a post-thyroidectomy neck, particularly um, some less experienced imagers, and there's no thyroid gland to take a picture of, they, people start taking pictures of a lot of things in the neck that belong there. They'll come out with a vocal cord picture or, you know, things that they haven't noticed before because they were so busy measuring 35 thyroid nodules, they didn't realize there's all this other stuff going on. But one of the things I want you to be aware of is that the cartilage of the neck calcifies. So it starts out as sonographically visible and then it can calcify as patients get older. It should be symmetric, it should be um, asymptomatic, because cartilaginous tumors, malignancies of the cartilage of the neck are extremely rare. But this is something that you may see on occasion, and I just want to bring your attention to it. Here's the thyroid cartilage here, and notice that the cartilage is widened or thickened a little bit, so the cartilage comes all along here, by this what looks like a cystic or a hypoechoic mass. You can see maybe some through transmission there, maybe a little calcification starting. Sagittally, you'll see it here, and it actually indeed just is expanding the cartilage here. Transversely, you can just see it posterior to the cartilage, just expanding the left. And this is a chondroid rest. And the ear, nose, and throat um, radiologists are used to seeing this. Here's another patient. This was a 22-year-old woman who had had papillary thyroid cancer as a teenager, had a complete thyroidectomy. We're looking for metastatic disease. But notice this is, again, within the cartilage, expanding the cartilage here. Sagittally looks like a hypoechoic recurrent lymph node. That's the picture they're going to bring you all the time. But turn transversely on it, and you'll see it's in the cartilage. And then this patient, because of her young age, we wanted to be sure, and here's the picture of it here. And I'm told by my ENT uh, radiology colloids that that is a chondroid rest and benign. Okay, last couple of cases. Remember uh, that you can have an esophageal diverticulum that occurs in the neck. These arise from the cervical esophagus. And when the air goes into this diverticulum, it can mimic the calcification of a thyroid cancer. So things that will help you differentiate Realize that you're not going to have the dense shadowing of calcium. You have dirty shadowing that goes with gas. You should be able to connect it to the esophagus. If you ask the patient to swallow, it will change configuration. And mostly, you have to think, wow, could this be an esophageal diverticulum? So here's a patient who came in in 2008. And this is the sagittal image of the left lobe of her thyroid. And you can see she has a pretty normal looking left lobe with a kind of calcified looking uh, piece in the back of the left lobe. And then an enormous lesion or thyroid nodule that came off the lower pole and went down into her superior mediastinum. So things go both ways. It can go from the thyroid down. And um, we, we biopsied this and it was benign, this thyroid nodule. She came back in 2013. The sonographer came out of the room and said, well, I think we might have messed up. We biopsied this, but we didn't biopsy this, looking back on the priors, because now it looks like this. And this is a big lesion. It's got calcifications in it. It's gotten much larger. It's got shadowing. It's got microcalcifications. I'm really worried that now she has a big, huge thyroid cancer. So here's a video clip from 2008. Here's her left lobe of her thyroid. Here's the big thyroid lesion. And here's that sort of funky looking echogenic thing that was in the back of the left lobe. And this is a little tiny esophageal diverticulum. And the esophagus is right here. When she came back in 2013, what the sonographer didn't realize is that she had had the left lobe of her thyroid removed. That whole big nodule was gone. The whole left lobe of her thyroid was gone. And what's happened is the, the, the esophageal diverticulum has become enormous. You can see that it connects to the esophagus right here because there's no longer a big five centimeter thyroid nodule or a left lobe of the thyroid pushing on that diverticulum and keeping it small. So now it could get as big as it wants. And so uh, all you had to say was, now wait a minute, did you do anything in the past five years? Oh yes, I had my left lobe removed uh, you know, somewhere else five years ago. Hmm. So there it is, esophageal diverticulum. You just have to think of it.
And the last case that I'm going to show, so we have a, um, an off-site location where images are sent into us, as I'm sure many of you do. And this, uh, our supervising sonographer sent in this image and said, can you just look at these pictures? I just want to get some input. This is a patient with neck pain, and I think she has subacute thyroiditis. That can be a tricky diagnosis to make. It's a little bit subtle sometimes, but it's important that those patients get treated with steroids. So you can look at this picture. This is a sagittal image, and she said, and I think in the back, part in the upper and back part, there's all this heterogeneity, and I think it's subacute thyroiditis. And I said, oh, and I'll just, here's the, video, here's the transverse video clip. And I was like, yeah, go back and take me another picture, because there's something else going on here, and I don't think it's subacute thyroiditis. So I'll give everybody a chance to look at that clip. And then I'll just point out, here's trachea, here's the carotid, here's the esophagus here, and here's the area that our um, senior sonographer was concerned about thyroiditis. Now I've stopped that clip. And I think it, you can all see that there is a foreign body running between the esophagus and this area here that she was concerned about, which turns out to be an abscess. The thyroid is completely normal. So she came over to the hospital. They did um, a barium swallow. And it's a little hard to see, so I put some arrows here to show you there it is right there. And then because we are radiologists and they often don't trust us, we did a CT. And here it is here. I think you can see it much nicer on the ultrasound, if I do say so myself. So this was a foreign body in the cervical esophagus that had perforated the cervical esophagus and created an abscess. And I will tell you, I'm going to have to get a picture. This foreign body turned out to be a piece of wire from a bristle brush used to clean her grill. So the husband cleaned the grill with the bristle brush, put the steaks on the grill. She ate her steak, because the first thing you say, were you eating a chicken, do you get a chicken bone or a fish bone or something like that? No, no, we had steak for dinner. But the steak went on the grill, picked up the little wire bristle, she swallowed it, perforated her esophagus, three or four days later came in with the abscess. So that brings me to my concluding slide, and I would remind you that not everything that's in and around the thyroid is a thyroid nodule.